Hello and welcome. You're listening to the Seasteading Today podcast, where we speak with entrepreneurs and researchers who are making the dream of seasteading a reality. The Seasteading Today podcast. Stop arguing and start seasteading. Hello, seasteaders. In this episode, I'm talking with Brendan Traxler of Atlantis Sea Colony. Atlantis Sea Colony is distinct from other seasteading projects that the Seasteading Institute supports because Brendan's focus is on underwater habitats. Brendan has been a true bedrock in the seasteader community, so whether you know him already or not, enjoy this conversation. Welcome, Brendan. So, Brendan, will you tell us how you got interested in underwater habitats? Wow. Um, I mean, you want the long story or the short story here because it could take a little bit. Let's go with the short story and then I uh, may ask you to clarify. <laughs> sure. Yeah. So basically, I mean, the short of it is, you know, uh, Jacques Cousteau in the early eighties on PBS, he, he instilled that love for the ocean of watching that with my mom growing up and then getting to the nineties sci-fi, um, TV shows like Sequest and stuff like that just reaffirmed that love. And is is one of those things where. This is maybe sci-fi, but you look at Star Trek and other sci-fi things and all the technology that has come from that, that is now in, in mainstream, why can't the same thing happen with the ocean? And this is back pre-internet, so I had no idea that a lot of the underwater habitats that had existed at this point even existed. So from there, I just started researching, dreaming, drawing, and you know, seeing what actually did work and what didn't work. And so it's been like a 25-year wave of getting to where we're at right now with lots of lulls in between. That's really interesting. Um, Joe Quirk has a theory that, you know, those big billionaires who are building rockets to go to space, that they were inspired by the space race in the 60s. And then, of course, all the science fiction that was that was around at that time about space. And here you are, you were you're watching slightly different science fiction and being inspired by the underwater right. version. So that's great. They just need to catch up with you, I think. Yeah, I mean, I think it's interesting that the space race and the the ocean race, if you want to call it that or whatever it is, has seemed to take the same curves there. You know, the 60s, 70s were huge for underwater as well with Cousteau and all that. And then it died off. And how we're here again with, you know, Bezos and Musk and everybody like that in the space race. And at the same time, there seems to be a lot of a lot of people working on underwater habitats to some extent. And, and even, you know, the sea setting aspect, too, it seems to really be growing at an exponential rate right now, too. So I think there's a there's some kind of correlation there, too. Yeah, I remember reading something about there's a difference between technological innovation on the macro level, like building rockets, building seasteads, those are all macro. And then it seems like in the 90s and early 2000s, people were focused on cell phones and mm. micro level technology. So we're coming yeah. back into a phase. It sounds like you're, you're observing we're coming back into a phase of, of the macro technology innovation. Yeah, that makes sense. And I think so, that, that, especially with that stuff, you know, because it sets the foundation too, where the technology, even though it was there before, especially for all these things, you know, 3D printing, all that kind of stuff, you know, now that it's it's so much ingrained into our, our everyday life, the ability to do a lot of stuff has be, has become a whole lot easier and more cost effective than it would have been even 10, 15 years ago. Right. That's really interesting. I wish I, I need to find someone who can, who's studying that, that trend and we can. Yeah explore it more. So, okay. So you're interested, you're inspired by Jacques Cousteau in the eighties. Now, were you, you were a child then? Yeah, I was born in 77. So yeah, I was, I was young. And so then did you go to school to study something that would help like engineering or design or anything along those lines? So no, actually I, a lot of it was self-taught. I took some drafting classes actually in, in high school, which definitely helped out a lot of the aspects of the thing. A lot of it has just been networking and finding people who are a lot smarter than I am to fill in those gaps and stuff like that that I don't know. I have a vision. I have a dream. I don't have any background for it. So I've been trying to find, you know, we've been actually uh, reaching out to uh, marine engineering schools and touching base with students there saying, hey, would you like to hop on board with us and look at what we're doing and, and take a, a stab at that? Uh, because I've hit up the marine uh, engineering firms and it's one of those things for a small startup that kind of money that are wanting to do designs and stuff like that is just way out of our ballpark at this point in time. So we're finding innovative ways to get around that. Okay. So when did you first hear about Seasteading and the Seasteading Institute? So it would have been, oof, uh, 
three, four years ago, not too long, honestly, but it was actually my dad. Cause I mean, he, he knows what I'm into and he's very supportive of what I'm doing. Um, he said, Hey, have you heard about this group? I'm like, Nope. So then I started digging in and really getting into you guys' social media and, and uh, looking up you guys and, and that's history. Okay. So you, so three or four years ago, that's when I started with the Sea Setting Institute. So that's, that's great. We were able to connect. Yeah, very cool. Yeah. And maybe is that maybe you taking over has, has, uh, this aspect has, has led to better social marketing or whatever it may be. And that's why I heard from you guys. Yeah. That was part of my focus coming in was to focus on building our community. So, and it, it's great. You know, we've seen in the last year, we've seen so many new projects and you're, mm -hmm. you're a big part of that, uh, of like showing me how do we welcome in these projects and offer support where we can and build the community of people who can who can learn from each other and help each other develop successful seasteads. Yeah, and absolutely. When I say seasteads, I'll just say that right now. I'm including your underwater designs. I feel <laughs> like they fit within the definition. <laughs> I agree. I think it's it's one of those those things where it doesn't instantly thought of that, but if you look at the definition, I think it falls right into there. And so that brings me to my next question. So your focus on underwater, starting with that inspiration and, and you've just stuck with that underwater inspiration and not thought about um, surface level building? You know, I, I have, especially, you know, after talking with um, the ocean builders and stuff along those lines, Chad over the ocean builders, we had them on our, our podcast and stuff like that a couple of years ago. And, and he had said, you know, at the very beginning, he was interested in underwater as well, but it migrated from that. So it got me thinking why and it makes a whole lot of sense. But it's one of those things where I think that my passion is here is, is underwater. I'm a huge fan of the sun. So, you know, it's one of those things where it's like, mm -hmm. I can avoid that. All joking aside, I mean, there is, there is some legitimacy to do that. But it's one of those things where it is a very uh, niche area that there's not too many people doing that for one reason or the other. So it's, it's where my passion has always been is, is underwater. So that's why I stick with that. And yeah, pretty much that. It's more so, uh, selfish reasons than anything. I mean, I, there's definitely business applications to it as well. But a lot of it comes from selfish motives. So you mentioned the sun. And I think for me personally, that would be a big issue. I need I need my sunshine. And so what are some of the other concerns when thinking about humans living underwater? You know, pressure, water pressure, and then access to sun. You know, are there potential health issues? How do you work with that? Yeah. Yeah, I think a lot of it's a psychological aspect too, especially at the first. You know, they're going to be smaller uh, tin cans for the most part. You know, what our project is working on based on a shipping container size um, living area. Obviously, you can expand upon that with modules and stuff along those lines, but it's still a small area that you're enclosed in. So I think the access to immediate topside access is important because, yeah, you're going to either have to deal with claustrophobia, psychological aspects of, of being contained down there, um, the lack of sunlight. Uh, there's a bunch of different areas that you have to factor in that you need to be able to get in and out as freely as you in and out your house to the most part without having to put on a bunch of equipment and swim to the surface. Are you able to start looking at those as design challenges for your habitats? Yeah. I mean, we've got, so we've got a, from you guys, we started our own discord community. And from that, we've had a bunch of people come in there and we've ever actually, actually um, delegate some of those design aspects as far as like a docking collar per se. So if you wanted to eventually have like a, a mini submarine or something like that dock to an underwater habitat, how does that all play out? So it's one of those things where obviously we'll have to address that sooner or later. Right now we're just working on our prototype. So it's one of those things where you're going to scuba dive down to that. We're not, we're not going all out yet on that, but down the road, that is one of those things where, how do you do it? Do you have an elevator system, a stairway system to the surface? Do you have a tunnel with a, whatever it may be, like a train or whatever, like not train, but like a, a rail system or something like that. Or do you have a submarine that docks with it um, and so forth um, or a tunnel to the land if you're close enough? There's a bunch of different aspects that could come into play. And I think a lot of them will come into play, especially as more and more habitats, hotels, business applications, colonies, whatever, start to get planted out there in the ocean. I think you'll see a bunch of different ways to, and even ways probably haven't even thought of and talked about right here are used to get people to and from a, a location w without them getting wet. I've always said, you know, if my grandmother cannot come visit it, then it's, it's not ready yet because I, it needs to be available to anybody, no matter how old or, or, or anything to be able to come and visit and leave it at will too. Sure. That's, I like that, that, uh, the, the grandmother standard. Yes. Yes. <laughs> so 
I've heard you mention before some projects, and it sounds like you can draw from from existing research. You know how what are some of the psychological problems? What are the physiological right. problems that come up? So I've heard you talk about Aquarius, Tektite, and Sea Lab programs. Can you tell us a little bit about those? Yeah, so most of those, you know, were uh, especially Tektite and um, was back in the '60s. Um, as far as design element, I just think it's a beautiful underwater habitat, which maybe I'm a little weird for that, think that that's mm -hmm. sexy, but whatever it is. Um, and, you know, they were, most of these were science led, you know, it was the government or whomever was, was funding a lot of these. Tektite was a, a little bit of a hybrid. And actually the, the designers of Tektite went on to build La Chalupa, which is now a Jules Undersea Resort, uh, Undersea Lab um, down in Key Largo, Florida, where you can actually go right now and spend the night in the only real underwater hotel there is out there. But yeah, and segueing over to Aquarius, again, they're still in existence. Sea Lab uh, was Navy as well, but they had a lot of correlation between that and um, space. There was a lot of testing between, you know, being underwater and being in space as far as analogs and stuff like, like that go. And Aquarius has kind of taken that over too, with being an analog for uh, NASA. They get used a whole lot for that aspect too. So you look at not only what we can take from the ocean as far as other underwater habitats, but what we can take from space as well and implement into underwater living and, and even, you know, with sea studying as well, because it's you're out and away from the facilities in the in the every day that we, we were used to and, and how do you implement that. And the difference with all the other habitats that have come before is you when you scuba dive down to them, you got pressurized to the, the pressure down there. So when you went to wanted to leave, you couldn't just swim to the surface depending on how long you're down there and how deep it was, it may take hours or days before you can come back up to the surface because you have to de decompress. So that's one of the design elements we have to avoid in order to, to make this available to every everybody. So what does that mean that you have to keep the habitat pressurized a certain amount so that people can come up to the surface at will? Right. So what plays out is, so every time you go 30 feet deep, it's another atmosphere. Um, and each time you do that, that changes how much saturation your body takes as you dive. Anybody that, that scuba dives understands that, you know, the deeper you go, the less downtime you have at the bottom because you need that time to come back up to the surface to let your body reacclimate. Um, so the, the goal, obviously, is one atmosphere, the surface level atmosphere you need to keep your habitat at. And there's a bunch of different design of ways you can do that, but usually it's you make the walls thicker and the deeper you go so you can uh, combat against that pressure. So that's why our prototype is only sitting around 20 foot. So we don't deal with going past that 30 foot mark where people start to deal with issues where you got to decompress coming back up. So, you know, if you go and spend the night, like Jules, they're at 22 foot. If you go spend the night right there, you can come right back to the surface, no problem after spending all night down there. Or if you spend a week down there, it doesn't make any difference. Um, but if you would move that 10 more feet and go below that 30 foot mark, you start spending more than a, a day down there, you, you end up having to start taking a longer and longer time to come back to the surface. As we talked about Aquarius, they're around 66 feet, I think. And you've got an hour. You can go down there. You can be there for an hour. But after that hour, you start getting into the saturation aspect. And you then are stuck into the, hey, now I'm stuck here. It's going to take me a long time to come back up to the surface. A little technical there, and especially dealing with pressures and all that kind of stuff. But it's one of those things where you have to make sure that you're staying at that one atmosphere to allow people to come and go at ease. Sure. Sorry if that was a little bit more technical and over the top than what you were asking there. No, no, no. Yeah. That's what I want. I want to, I want to okay. learn all of that. <laughs> so Get a little carried away there. No. So are there other, I want to say more cultural stumbling blocks or to, to get people to consider living underwater? Like what are some of the immediate reactions you get from people when you tell them that you're interested in underwater living? You just laughed at. Oh, no. <laughs> I mean, that's a lot of people do this. So that's crazy. You know, you're, or like, let's use the grandma, for example. I told my grandma, she's like, well, I'm not going there um, time of thing. But um, it, it is, it's one of those things where people, you know, immediately think underwater, they're going to get, what if, what if it leaks? What if uh, claustrophobic? You know, I don't want to drown. You know, I'm not going to get eaten by a fish. Uh, all these different things that people usually say. And it's, it's a lot of education. I think with anything that we're doing with this fringe type of stuff, that it's all about education. and, and explaining to people now your preconception is this because that's what media has shown you through movies and all this kind of stuff but here's what really what's what's going down sure and that makes me think of like people get into cars every day but if you yeah. went back to 1920 when right. cars were brand new technology and you said this thing will go 90 miles per hour they'd probably say the same thing right they probably yeah, did absolutely <laughs> so 
they need to see it in action. So have you shown your grandmother pictures of some of those gorgeous underwater hotels? Oh yeah. She just shakes her head and says, well, that's, that's nice or whatever. But yeah, she's, she's kind of stubborn like that. So she's, she's not going to change her mind. Gotcha. Okay. So let's talk about um, the ecosystem. Cause I've heard you say that you want your um, habitats to improve the ecosystem. So yeah. tell us a bit about that. So yeah, it's one of those things where it's a question that, especially early on when our social media presence started getting bigger and bigger that people would hit us up off from that. It was like, just leave the ocean alone. You know, we do enough damage already and all that's true. And I saw, I don't know who said it, but there was somebody and they had said something similar to this um, that, you know, by us being underwater, it, it's, it raises awareness to an extent too. If, if people are sitting there and they're looking out their window every day, are they going to want to trash it as much? And, and, you know, sitting again and say on this, like, well, look at the the roads right now when you're driving down, there's trash all the time there too. And I, and I get that. But I think that as a business owner, it's in our best interest to do everything we can to keep those waters as pristine and beautiful as possible because nobody's going to want to go stay at a, an underwater habitat if it looks like garbage outside. So there's that. So, I mean, there's different, even on uh, your guys' social media, there's, there's been floating um, houses and stuff like that that have grown core outside of them in an underwater room. Um, to draw fish and stuff. There's a bunch that we can do to seed the environment around there, whether it be with coral or, or plant life or whatever, to enhance what we're putting in there. Obviously, when putting anything in the ocean, you're going to disrupt the environment temporarily. But that's why it's in, we need to be stewards of what we're doing there and making sure that we are going back in tenfold, if possible, re, you know, replenishing what we may have disrupted. And, and it's been shown too that, you know, habitats anything stuck underwater it attracts all types of life so it's going to be one of those things where the, the battle is constantly going to be keeping it clean so it doesn't the the environment doesn't take over what we've created there too so it's it's going to be a it's definitely going to enhance it it's just a, a, at what level and how quickly right so i know that some of our seasteaders ocean builders in particular is, is looking at incorporating the coral design so that the coral becomes right. part of the structure and ha helps uh, keep it floating at the right height. <laughs> so is that, are you looking at some solutions like that of like with boats? One thing we hear sometimes is why not just live on a boat? And one of the major main arguments is that you have to clean barnacles off a boat, but if you can build a seastead that benefits from having barnacles on it, you know, is that possible? Just, you know, are you, is it able to keep a structure for human use, you know, still workable, but also have the sea life uh, using it too. Like, I, I don't want to compromise any structure. You know what I mean? Right. Yeah. Yeah. And, and you, the other thing is, as long as it doesn't start covering up your viewports or your windows and stuff along those lines too. So it's uh, negating that view outside too. But yeah, a hundred percent. And you know, it's one of the things I've, when I saw what Ocean Builders was working on with that, I was like, man, yeah, that's brilliant that can definitely be incorporated to not only almost any seaside but especially underwater too there it's a no-brainer why you wouldn't do something similar to that on your habitat you know because why not right so how do you see i've heard you talk about in our seasetting social which people should definitely go back and listen to if they haven't already you talked a little bit about a symbiotic relationship between underwater habitats and surface seasteads so can you tell us again uh, you know how you see that working out yeah i mean obviously ideally um it'd, it'd be nice to have some kind of symbiotic relationship there because you know we do um especially you know a lot of them can be moved um especially if you got a hurricane or something coming through there or some kind of catastrophe move them move your sea state out of the way whereas if we're deep enough underwater it doesn't really affect us that much but we could be a, a, a escape area for that i mean there's a bunch of different business applications or personal applications you can see from that whether it is energy storage, you know, even maybe deal with waste relocation, um, not looking at it from a purely standpoint of what do you do with people? What, what do you do with the, the byproducts or the, the necessities that a, a seastead may need? Now, I understand that most of the people are designing their seasteads that incorporate all these things on there. But um, at the same time, I think that some of those could benefit both ways. You know, we ideally would want some place on surface to tether power um, communications and stuff at first too, as well. At the same time, I see it as, you know, you could, especially if you're looking at in from the standpoint of a resort or a getaway type of thing, partner, there, you spend half your time up on the seaside, half your time in an underwater hotel type of thing too. So like I say, there's, there's a lot of different, even research, you know, the nice thing about being in a, in a pressurized or it could be a pressurized environment is you can change the oxygen levels in the concealed 
environment of an underwater habitat. So plant growth can be affected on that um, health um, for, you know, whether uh, medical reasons and stuff along those lines. So there's a lot, there's a lot that can be done. And once again, you can do all, a lot of these things similar on a sea set as well with hyperbaric chambers and pressurized vessels and stuff along those lines. But th yeah, that's kind of where I see it. We're a bunch of different possibilities. And like I said, there's probably a thousand more that, that are going to crop up that we haven't even thought about. So I'd like to talk a little bit now about starting a seastead business. So it's a new, whole new industry. Mm -hmm. And so I'd like to know a little bit about how you've approached that. So Atlanta Sea Colony, what is the life cycle of it? Is it an incorporated business? When did that happen and how did you make that decision? Yeah, so it is, it's an LLC. I started that finally three or four years ago. We'd had the website's been up since the early 2000s. Um, so it's like we've had a footprint on the internet for a couple of decades now. Um, it's one of those things where I, uh, it's one of things where I, I can either keep on sitting here talking about it and telling it to people and dreaming, or I can actually do something about it finally and, and, and take a risk and do something. So I incorporated the business and, you know, started funneling more money into it and, and marketing and bringing on people to help out all volunteers at this point in time. But it's one of those things where all this stuff is, is such a, New from a business standpoint, obviously, you know, you said this, a lot of stuff has been around for decades, but from a business standpoint, it's how do you classify a lot of this stuff? What are we doing? Um, you know, when I was filling up the, the, the documents for creating the business, it's like classify your business. Well, I, I don't know. I mean, we're underwater uh, habitat where there's no classification for you like thing like that. So you got to engineering or whatever it may be. Um, and that's just from the business side of things, but yeah, it, it is very difficult because, and that's one of the struggles I, I talk to, you know, some people close to the business like that is like, I just don't know how to properly market sometimes what, what we do because it, it can do so many different things um, and nobody understands it and nobody else is doing it or has done it really. Um, so there is no legwork to run off of. Like I said, all the other habitats in the past have been always military for the most part. So you can't really go off of them because we're definitely not in the military arena. Uh, so yeah, it, it, it it's a interesting dynamic that we have to deal with. And I think uh, probably a bunch of the, the sea setters uh, running the same situation too, is how do you define and how do you build on something that hasn't really existed before? Uh, yeah, I run into that with the nonprofit when they try to categorize what kind of nonprofit we are. It's like, right. it's there's no category yet for us. So hopefully we're carving that out. So you mentioned you're bringing on some people to help. Who is part of your team and how are they helping? So uh, if anybody's seen any of our stuff, you know Adam. He does most of our stuff. Uh, he's He's been a friend for years. So he came on as wanting to be involved with something um, bigger and, and support me. And he's just really fit in as far as he's a whole lot more outgoing than I am. So sometimes he'll take the lead on some stuff that I would have normally put the brakes on. But at the same time, he's moving, the, moving things forward. And he's made me think on some things and change some things. So it's one of those people that's not a yes man has definitely come on to help understand what we're doing and then question what we're doing. And, and so that's definitely helped out. Um, and then because we have Patreon supporters and stuff like that, we've actually, one of our patrons has really come on board and is actually working on some material for us, doing some deep dives on underwater habitats to make some, sh uh, some VODs on that. Um, and actually uh, him and me are planning a trip back to Jules this, this summer as well. So and he's done some good work on trying to get some contacts as far as interviews for, once again, the whole thing with, you know, interviews, as you know, it's one of those things where just getting the, the name out there and it's more networking and, and bring to light other people's stuff as, at the same time, bringing to light what we're doing. So there's that. And then we've got, like I say, and I'm, I am working with one college student right now on some engineering stuff. And yeah, that's, that's really right now. I, of course, I use my sister from time to time for any type of financial stuff since that's her background. So keep it in the family there. But um, yeah, that's pretty much the, 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 the team as of right now. Would you call Atlantic Sea Colony a startup? Like, are you looking actively looking for investors? We've, we've talked to a couple of investors in the in the past. Yeah, I mean, I'm I'm not opposed to. It. I think we're we've got a business plan. We've got we know what we're we're focus is. We know what we're trying to do. Even a whole lot better than two years ago. So yeah, I, I would definitely entertain investors at this point in time. Would love to actually get the prototype built this year. That's how that's how confident we are in the designs that we do have and what we're working on. So yes, money goes a long way as we, we are all very aware that it's money at this point in time for a lot of us that, that's holding up our projects. So yeah, absolutely. 
I'm glad you brought up your prototype. Can you tell us a bit about that whole process of of designing the prototype and you know what questions you need to answer with the prototype and challenges getting it in some water? Yeah. Will it hold the water out? That's the biggest question right there. Uh, but no, so, um, it, it, it's one of those things where, once again, this is where Adam came into play because I get very set on my mindset on this is what I want. This is how I want it to look. And I'm not going to deviate from that. You know, so he, so we ended up stripping it back saying, hey, let's just, you know, what's the, the bare, the bare level that we can go with to cut costs for one thing, but not cut safety at the same time. Obviously we don't, I'm, I'm going to be spending the night in there. So I, I want to make sure it's going to work. So that's what we, we started stripping it back to, hey, we don't need the pressure environment because it's only at 20 feet. So we don't have to worry about having really thick walls. With it being close to shore, we don't have to worry about it generating its own water or oxygen or electricity or anything like that. So we can pump it all in from the surface. Um, we can strip it down to, we need a building or a habitat that we're stuck under water that will hold out the water at the same time, allow somebody to spend the night in there, spend a day in there, whatever it may be, and uh, go from there. Uh, obviously, there's some things that you know, we're, we're going to try to do different than some habitats have done in the past. And that's one of the reasons why trying to go simple with it so we can test out some of the design elements. But yeah, that's basically basically it is, is how can we do this on a smaller budget since a lot of it is being self-funded um, short of investors coming along? Um, and, and how do we do it safe? But at the same time, I wanted to make sure that what we're doing sets the foundation for what's going to come next. And so that a lot of the design elements and the, the structural elements will be used when we go into phase two, or I call it the bring to market design, where this is the one we'll be putting out in the ocean and so forth. Can you tell us a, a little bit more detail? So you said that you want your design to be doing something different than what habitats have been used for in the past. So so tell us again, what are some of those differences yeah. for you? So one of the big things, and I was talking to a friend several years ago, who's also built an underwater habitat for um NASA is an analog system back in the 90s for NASA. And he was talking about one of the biggest struggles is getting the thing underwater. Because like I said, I think, I think on the sea setting social is you picture a balloon. When you're in the pool and you try to push a balloon underwater, it doesn't want to go because it's a structure filled with air and it's not going to go underwater. So how do you get something that's full of air down to the bottom of the ocean or bottom of lake bed or whatever it may be going? In the past, they've always filled it with ballast or whatever and, and sunk it to the bottom. And then, you know, with tons of weight, they've held it on the bottom of the ocean. The one thing I, I think that we can do different is it's a, a two, our, our prototype is going to be a, a two part thing. It's going to be the main structure and then the base. So we're just going to drop the base because it's just steel and concrete for the most part and level it out on the bottom. And then at that point in time, then we can tether the main habitat to it and pull it down onto the base. The, the difference there is that you can raise it and lower it as need be. If you, if something goes wrong, you don't lose the whole thing that we can raise it back to the surface, we can replace it, we can fix it, whatever, and then we can bring it back down again, is what we're going to try to shoot for. Everybody I've talked to seems to think this is going to work until we actually do it. I don't know. We're actually going to, uh, hopefully this summer, I'm going to get some mock-ups, some scaled-down versions and start testing around with that too. But that's the, the biggest design element that we're going to test on on the prototype. And what uh, what sort of industries do you think will be the first adopters of going underwater? That's a good question. You know, it's a blue revolution, a lot, blue revolution. Let me talk there. It's, it's starting to get a little bit of hype. You know, you look, look at the fishing industries and stuff along those lines. And I think that if that wave continues, no pun intended there, that it opens up to everything. I don't see any application necessarily that can't translate from, from land to the ocean. I've talked extensively about underwater data centers. My background's in IT. Um, and then you look at Microsoft has tested this out actually with putting a data center underwater for extended periods of time. There's tons of benefits from that, from cooling costs to electrical costs to, they even saw a, Microsoft said that their servers lasted longer in this environment. So there's that. You look at food production, whether the fishing takes care of itself type of thing with what's being done there, but you need plant growth and stuff along those lines. So you could have a greenhouses. Again, you can regulate the, the oxygen levels underwater so you can get the best growth out of your, your plants. Yeah, I even saw somebody, something... I saw something about greenhouses underwater, and it also was great for pest control. Yeah, absolutely. And, and, and for me, personally, I, I deal with sinus issues tons. So it's one of those things where, man, I'm not going to have to deal with that anymore if I'm of underwater because I'm, I'm not going to have to deal with all that. So that's one of my, my selfish reasons for wanting to do it. 
Sure. But then you look also, somebody, somebody hit me up and says, hey, what about like a, you know, the preppers and stuff along those lines? What if you had like a, a shelter for Lachlan? Absolutely. You could have the ultra rich buying underwater habitats for doomsday prepping or whatever too. So, I mean, there's, there's that, there's energy, um, you know, with the wind farms and stuff along those lines. If you got a local place to store excess b- uh, batteries and stuff along those lines, you could do that. I don't know how much of a need there is for that, but it is a possibility. Um, and so, like I said, there's there's a bunch of different applications that you can run into when you start building off the water uh, off the coast. All right. So you mentioned before you had Adam come on to help with educating the public, basically. And so, mm-hmm. tell us a bit about that. So you do these weekly live stream videos. We do actually. The week we're recording this it was actually we did our last one for a while. It's something we've been doing for over a year, where we do a, a weekly every Tuesday night. We'd come on. Open up to the public. Usually have topics on there. We talk about different stuff. We'd have interviews on. We feel like it's it's run its course. We're still going to do ones every once in a while. It's just not going to be every week. Um, a lot of times we turn those into our podcasts as well. So which you've been on the podcast, you've been on the, the live as well. So you've been on all of our stuff. But yeah, it's it's one of those things where everything we can do to get the word out there as far as what is going on in the ocean, not only just with underwater habitats, but just in general, because I think there is a lot that's going on. And that just people don't know about it. So I figure if there's one little thing we can do, I think we need we need to do that. And so that's why we started doing the podcast. Well, not the podcast, but the, the live every week. Like I said, we're still working on some interviews for that. Or one of our patrons, his name is Babe, actually. He's working on some of the stuff for underwater habitats. And so we'll be doing regular lives and events on Tuesday nights and stuff. But it's just not going to be every week going forward. And so doing those live streams, is that what helped you build your Patreon or did you have the Patreon before that? It definitely helped it. Um, it was one of those things where it was one of those things where that and the, honestly in the Discord too, uh, I think they went hand in hand there. With with the uh, live, we were able to, to communicate back in real time with people in a live environment. And it was one of those things where they could see and, and hear our passion and what we're doing in here. So I think that there's a, a connection there with being able to not only hear the inflections in your voice, but actually see it too. And we're able to show stuff off. And on a weekly basis, we were able to be very um, caught up. Sometimes I would, you know, I would write the the episode we're, we're going to do that night, the day of. Um, so it was really caught up with what what's going on in, in the world and stuff along those lines. And then you know, obviously we give a shout out to our Patreons and stuff along those lines. And we threw it out there. Hey, if anybody, you know, is good at speaking and wants to come on or even take over the live for that standpoint, if, if we want to delegate that off to somebody else, um, that was one of the perks we were throwing out to our Patreons if they, you know, try to give them more skin in the game, I guess. That's really interesting that because underwater living is not something that most people are thinking about on a daily basis, yeah. that it humanizes you in Atlantis Sea Colony. And I know, you know, I've seen seasteaders be demonized in the press. And even if you're interviewed by a friendly member of the press, there's a distance there between you and the reader. But if you're just showing up as yourself on a video every week and can communicate live, I think it goes a long way to building trust and building the concept that, no, these are real people. They're not out to scam you. They're not out to fool anyone. They're just trying to get support for their idea. And that was was a big portion of it too. That's why Adam was one of the discussions we had because he's like, man, we don't need to do this every week. I'm like, my whole purpose for doing it ultimately was I wanted a track record that showed that, hey, we've been talking about this for a long time. We're not some fly-by-night organization that just came up and had some pretty designs on our website that we're serious about this. And here's who I am. Here's what I'm doing. If you have questions or you think we're fake, you go back and look at our track record. We've been doing this for, our YouTube channel has, I don't know how many hundreds of videos on it now from uh, stuff I've either created, interviews we've done live streams and stuff along those lines. And it's something we're not going to stop with because I, the more we can get out there in in my my opinion, the more it validifies who we are and what we're doing. Now I know that's, it seems to be in the underwater habitat world. We're the only ones that feel that way, that way because everybody else I've talked to is like in ghost mode and wants no notoriety. doesn't want to talk about what they're doing at all. So maybe we're wrong, but that's just my opinion on it. Oh, that's interesting. Okay. So there are other folks in this space, but they're not interested in, being in the public eye. It, very much so. I actually talked to one last week who just popped up. Um, he said, I don't want to post anything until we have something in the water. And I was like, okay. I mean, I, I get that. And then there's another person I've talked to on the phone a couple of times. You know, he puts stuff out every once in a while, but he's very similar. And then there's, we have a counterpart over in Turkey that actually we have an event tomorrow with. 
he's very anti social media as far as posting anything out there. Actually, we're doing this event tomorrow, and he was. I had to fight to get the thing to even be broadcast on the internet because he didn't want stuff out there. I'm like, I, I don't get it. I, I don't get it. But you know, everybody's got their own vision and their their plan on how they're going to do it. It just to me, it seems like you'd want that out there, even if to me it holds me more accountable because if I'm saying these things, I have to act on them. I can't just sit back behind a screen and post stuff and then never do anything with it. Are these other projects able to get funding or like, how do they know if they have customers out there? Like, this is just my, my ignorance. I don't know how a, how yeah. a business navigates that without having right. their public presence. Yeah, no, and none of them do. And that's, that's the problem is everybody, funding is always the, the Achilles heel for all these. A lot of these guys have some really good designs and some really good ideas. And some of them are, you know, are very good on that, the financial front where they're doing the legwork themselves. They're reaching out to people and they're saying, hey, here's what we're doing and stuff along those lines. And maybe that works. Maybe they know the right keywords and stuff to say to people or have the right contacts. But it's one of those things where if I was investing my money in something and I went to your website and there was nothing there or there was very little there and there was no track record for you. Like the one company that I just talked to last week, the first thing I did is I, I checked their dona- domain name and see how long have you been registered as a domain? It only been a couple months. So I was like, all right, what are you guys doing? Because you're obviously brand new, but you're making some big, bold claims. So it, it's one of those things where it's mind-boggling to me to some extent. But who knows? They, they may know something I don't know. Yeah, that's interesting. Well, that is all I had to ask you about today. So is right, there anything good. else you want to talk about or, or let the sea setting audience know about Atlantis Sea Colony? Find us, you know, our social media stuff. I'm sure you'll post it out there, but it's all AtlantisColony.com. We've got all of our links to everything out there. Anybody that's interested, you can join our Discord. That's always a great place to come. Or just check us out on our social media stuff. Or hit me up. I'm always more than welcome to talk, you know, do video talk, phone calls, whatever. I, I love talking about this stuff, whether it's above the ocean or under the ocean. Obviously, I'm more knowledgeable about under the water, but I just love talking about it, and I'll talk about it all day long. And what is your next step with Atlantis Sea Colony? What are you working on right now? Right now, we are actively getting together a hard price list for everything we need for this prototype so that we can know exactly how much money we're, or a good estimate. Obviously, when you're doing something new, you never know exactly how much the costs are going to be because stuff's going to come up. Um, but a, a better S- idea of exactly how much we need. We have an idea how much we need, but um, we're fine t- tuning some costs on that to, the kind of idea so that we can either approach investors or put it out there for crowdfunding purposes and say, hey, you want to throw some money at this thing and, and help us build this? Okay, so I think we're great. And, you know, thank you so cool. much, Brendan. You're my first no. interview of season four. So yeah. thank you so much, Brendan. No, thank you for having me. The Seasteading Today podcast is produced and edited by Alexander T. Clayton. Your host is Carly Jackson. You can send feedback and questions to podcast at seasteading.org. If you would like to support the podcast and the Seasteading mission, go to seasteading.org slash donate. If you'd like to know more about seasteading, read the book, Seasteading, How Floating Nations Will Restore the Environment, Enrich the Poor, Cure the Sick, and liberate humanity from politicians by Joe Quirk. Please be sure to like and subscribe to our podcast, and we'll see you on the sea.